asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And as we're all would say, so be it. <laughs> Does lapel mic work? Should, yeah. Get that one in. <laughs> Children's Church. Everything should have been laid up there. Where's that? Alina. Alina. Sure? Yeah, there's nothing here. Okay. Who's young and grabbing the pal line? Ha! Back here. We'll find out in just a second. <laughs> Am I working? Yes. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the walk or the journeys, it used to be called chrysalises, but they're called journeys now. It is a weekend gathering that is closest to heaven on earth that you're going to get because your cell phones are put away, watches are put away so that you don't know any comprehension of time and everything. And you get to love and serve one another. It's really, really awesome. So I'll talk a little bit more about that today. And remember that Sam is going um, and Laura Hester is going also on the journey that's coming up. And then we'll have some people working it and stuff as well. And what Kim didn't say, because she's not going to say it, it's the kind of person she is. She said it, but you might not have understood it. When the youth group kind of dissolved, her and Logan took on this child. They've been supporting this child. Thank you for doing that. And the pictures and the things that's there are, are, will blow you away. So if you can give to that, she's asking now to make it really special. She's going to continue to give, and then we'll see about another child if, if so choose or whatever. But speaking of the walk, um, we had Marianne that went, Jeannie that went, and um, Bridget that went to experience that for the first time. And Marianne would like to come up here and talk, so come on. <laughs> well, you're coming. So I'm going to lay this right here. You can hold it or oh, clip it. I can it. holler. <laughs> I want it. I want it to pick up back okay. there. So you have okay. to hold it or clip it right there. Okay. Here. Okay. Well, I'm going to make this short. I, I, Alan asked me if I wanted to share, and I got up in front of a whole church full of people and shared that I didn't know. So I figured I could share with you guys, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I don't really have a whole lot to, to say. All I want to, I'm speechless about how it was. There is no words that I know in the English language that can tell you how good I felt when I left there. Um, it was phenomenal. Um, I never, I'm not a crier. I'm going to here in a minute though. Um, I'm not a crier, but I never cried so much in my life. Um, strangers I'm crying with and you know, it, it was phenomenal. That's all I can say is, oh, downside, four days without a shower. Ooh. <laughs> That was about the only downside, other than the fact that I probably gained 10 pounds with the chocolate, but other than that, I'm all good. <laughs> Thank you. So if you're familiar with the walk, and if you're not, I'm going to give you a term. It's called fourth day. And what the fourth day is, is your walk outside of that what it's our walk now as a christian so that we are walking a life that brings glory and honor to god professing the name of jesus christ so that others may know him so i want to talk about that a little bit today um and i'm hoping that some of the ladies will watch this as well 
so that they can get another talk from Pastor Allen <laughs> this, you know, this week and follow up with it. And I'm so glad to not be needed here because I heard that you had a wonderful time with Nick. Except that I heard he's even longer than I am. <laughs> so, but he was here preaching his heart. And I was there, he was actually here preaching my heart, which is preaching God's heart. And I was doing the same thing there. It was an amazing coincidence, and when I say that, usually I am talking sarcastically, that that was God's plan. That Nick didn't realize that he had a family reunion that Saturday and had to change, and then that I would go in in his place. And you know that I said I was very apprehensive about going to a women's walk. You know, I didn't know what that would entail and everything. Didn't know if I, how I would handle that. And God took every apprehension that I had and He flipped them upside down. And I don't mean He just took them away. I mean, He is a God with humor. I knew these things, but He showed me in His way how whatever was my worry, He took it and just totally turned it upside down. The woman who was the director of the walk went to her pastor and said, can we, what do you think about this Allen guy? Do you know him? Oh, I don't know. Let me see. Oh, this, he might be liberal. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking the same thing. Uh, looking at, you know, different things. I'm not going to say what things I looked at because that would be pointing fingers. But I said, oh, this guy, he might be liberal. You can figure out where that comes from. And I'm thinking, how is this going to work? And they're like, well, we're just going to pray and give it to God that he's not going to be. And I prayed and gave it to God, and there was nothing liberal about that. I thanked him for being a conservative Christian. And he said, I'm not a conservative Christian. He said, I believe and preach the Bible. Man, that was a blessing. He's totally different than I am. But I feel like I have a new brother that I never had and a sister that I never had in Christ. It was what a wonderful experience. So Nick mentioned last week that one of his shows that he liked to watch was um, Home Improvement. Did you catch that at all? Yeah. So what time is it? Time. <laughs> no, it's time to talk about the fourth day, but very good. You knew where I was going. <laughs> Which is continuing to walk in grace from now on until the day we die or till Jesus Christ comes again. We continue to walk by grace. God's grace, His empowerment. He's the one that came to us, offered us salvation. He's the one that created us, the one that came to us and offered us salvation. And He's the one who will continue that walk for us. We are sanctified, set apart, made holy by God. And it is His will that we continue to be sanctified by the Word and by the Spirit. As we read this revelation of God, Jesus Christ made flesh and dwelt among us, and we bend our will to His will and to die to our, our will to, to, so that He can live, the Spirit will reveal Jesus Christ who is God the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And we have the words written here and we have the Spirit that testifies and relates to our spirit so that we can worship in spirit and truth. Now the reason I say that is because so many times, okay, we're saved and everything, so let me keep trying. I need to keep dying, not trying. That's what I need to do so that I can live. Because I will continue to fail. But because Christ lives in me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do that. So like I said, I had a lot of apprehension and God just told me, He said, you know these words, you know what I can do. And the scripture kept coming to, to my head through the Spirit, not you know, burning bushes or anything else. I got this. I got this. And then he would show me all these things that I like, oh, you know, I was worried about that. And he'd just flip it upside down and, and bring the joy in it. When I did my last talk, I opened with Psalm 23. And coincidentally again, or ironically, Psalm 23 was what our trek was this week in Iwanis. Huh? trek. That's kind of like a fourth day, isn't it? This trek that we're on. But that's what the Awanas program is called, coincidentally. And we talked about that Psalm 23 and explained that with my children and everything. 
I failed to mention what I wanted to mention, and I'll get to this in a little bit at the closing because it were God's words, not my words, and I don't get down after and say, oh, I forgot this or forgot that. What came to you came to you, and you spoke it because of that hope that lives inside of you. And I started out with Psalm 23 from the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. And I explained a little bit of that, and I explained to the children, you know, and they were like, oh, that's why I still waters, because the sheep won't drink from moving water. I don't know if you know that or not. There's a lot of things we can learn, but you don't even have to know that. You can still know that he provides me that water. And Jesus said, I am the living water. You'll never thirst again. Scripture is alive. You'll get different things out of it. If you come to your Father wanting Him to reveal His will and His way to you, He will make Himself known. But I wanted to point out some different translations that have a little different spin on that verse. And I never got to that in the walk. So ladies, if they get to see that today, they'll, they'll get to hear this part, unless it doesn't come out again. But I'm pretty sure it will, because it's here in my notes. The King James... Versions a little harder for us to understand because it's written in English that is not familiar to us. Because we don't talketh that way, do we? That wayeth. How's that? That wayeth. So if you can read a translation that speaks to you clear, do it. Don't worry about whether it's King James Version or not. Okay? The King James Version is a accepted version of the Bible. There are many that are. And when I say accepted, people have got together and said this word, whatever translation it is, which this is the NCV, and I don't even know what some of them stand for, and they've said that this is the Word of God. It doesn't vary from it. So you know that you're reading what's the Word of God. You're not reading something else, getting some other word other than Jesus Christ. But if you can read something that comes to you clearer, then you eat it up. You consume it. You concentrate and fill yourself with every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Uh, it is that word in His Spirit that will sanctify you and make you whole. Do you have that image? Can you put that image up? I got this this week. Jacob showed it to me. I think it was on Facebook. And I thought how sad with the comment that came about it because it said the King James Version's the only one, don't be misled and everything. And if you see it, it says, why did Jesus come to earth? Well, if you read the NIV and you read the King James, you can answer that question. But they take two examples and they say, here's why you don't want to look at the NIV. Because in Matthew 18, 11, and if you've got one of these, I'll, you can look at it and see, where if you have one of these in your pew, you won't see it. This is an older version of NIV. This is a newer version. If you go to Matthew 18, 11 in the newer version, you'll see a little footnote A, because that verse is missing completely. The reason that it's missing is because most of the Old Testament, excuse me, not Old Testament, but New Testament documents that we have, the textual uh, documents don't have that verse. Did King James add it? Maybe. Did it, did, it, did it get lost in some of the copies? Maybe. I wasn't there, were you? But I know that the Word of God is consistent here. So the NIV takes that verse out and says some manuscripts don't have this. So we have taken it out because of the textual verification of it. It doesn't change God's Word at all, and as far as the question goes, when we read God's Word, it is the same. So I thought how sad that this was getting passed around. Don't, don't read any version but King James Version. Read whichever version speaks to you and read it and consume it so that it will change your heart. Okay? And I'm going to give you some examples in a little bit. Thank you, Logan. Um, the question is, why did Jesus come to earth? And you know, that's a question that a lot of Christians don't really have a good, a good answer for. He came to save me. Uh, sure, yeah, that's a good answer. But he came to save me from my sin, that I would not sin anymore. 
He says to be perfect like our Heavenly Father is perfect. And if I don't realize the power of the Spirit and die to, to the Spirit so that I might live, and I don't realize that I'm supposed to take up a cross and follow after Jesus, then what good is my salvation? If a doctor saves you from cancer and you go back to living in the sewage that you were in in the first place, what did he save you from? What did he save you for? God has saved you so that you will worship him like you were originally designed and you get to be a child of the most high on top of that and spend eternity in heaven. But you definitely have a responsibility to walk by grace, to walk that fourth day. And both translations, the NIV, the King James, answer that question accurately. We are to be one who imitates Christ. In John chapter 12, we have studied and studied it, that we read that Jesus' final words to the crowds were, you need to die in order to create a harvest of new lives. If you don't die, if you don't repent from your way of thinking and change and come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me, you will never, ever do that. Your children won't follow. Scripture's clear about that again. We're supposed to talk about him when we get up, talk about him when we go to bed, talk about it when we go on our walk, talk about it when we come back, talk about it at work, talk about it when we sit down at our meals, put scriptures on our hands and forehead, place them on the doorposts of our house. That's training up our child. And the word train involves discipline as well also. You're supposed to discipline them when they fall short. And we've got tons of examples. We happen to have that as an example in our uh, Awana's Wednesday. Remember that one, Joy? <laughs> we read about Tamar, if you're familiar with that. And basically, that's a brother and sister incest rape situation. Oh, that was fun explaining to a bunch of 12-year-olds. But David did not discipline. And that went, sin went further and further and further. Just like he himself was disciplined and saw his sins in lust, which was adultery, which led to murder to cover it up. And when he realized it, because we don't realize it so many times when we're there, he said, against you, Lord, and only you have I sinned. Forgive me. He hurt other people. <laughs> people died. But he sinned against God and had to make that right. Before John chapter 12, we find these words in John chapter 10. Therefore, and the word therefore is referring to something further back, so I'm going to let you read that. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, or truly, truly, depending on the translation that you get, says basically the same thing. I am the gate for the sheep. I meant there's no other gate. You can't come in to that pen and find green pastures and, and still waters unless you come through Jesus Christ. If you read any other word that gives you that, throw it away. But the Bible tells you clearly that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, no matter which translation you get. Verse 8, All who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Period. All of them. But the sheep have not listened to them. True sheep. Not ones who call themselves sheep. Scripture's clear about that too. They'll be separated on the day when Christ returns. They'll be labeled as goats, not sheep. The true sheep have, listened to, have not listened to them. Verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. You can have that security that you are a child of the Most High and nothing will ever separate you. Now, if you are, what are you going to do with it? They will come in and go out and find pasture. Kind of reminds us of Psalm 23 right there, doesn't it? The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life. Not eternal life here, life. Life now, here and now. And not only that, but to have it to the full, the fullest, the maxed, whatever words you want to put there. That the life that they still have, they've been healed, 
to live an abundant life now, a life that glorifies God, that draws their children and others to Jesus Christ because we are the hands and feet of Christ, the salt of this world, which is used for preservative and flavor. And if we don't do that, what good is that salt except to be trampled under the feet of men? It's worthless. So back to Psalm 23. I gave you the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. Here's what the NIV says. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Here's the NLT. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. The message is still the same, but I'm, I'm getting other words that are making me think even more. Rest. Ooh, that's why I'm lying down in the green pastures. I, I've got grass there where I can eat and everything, but I've also got rest and security. The ISV says the Lord is the one who is shepherding me. Oh, okay, yeah. I lack nothing. He causes me to lie down in pastures of green grass. He guides me beside quiet waters. Now I'm going to give you the HAH version. Have you all ever heard of that? It's the Henry Allen Henson version. Okay? <laughs> because God loved me so much, He sent His only Son, His one and only Son, to the world to die in my place so that I might live for God, my Lord and Savior. And because He is shepherding me through this life, there is nothing that I lack. In fact, nothing that I could ever dream, desire or dream of that He will not supply. For He has even come to live inside of me. I will not want for <clears throat> I will not want for I have all that I need for all of eternity. Verse two, we're just at verse two now. God, He is the one who causes me to find rest. For without Him, I would seek to find rest in places of unrest. I would seek to be nourished and filled from things that cannot provide lasting nourishment. God has given me eternal food, peace, and rest in Jesus Christ. And God leads me to everlasting water, and I will never, ever thirst. Instead, I will have the privilege and glory to be a spring of living water to, uh, coming up inside of me, pointing others to God's love and salvation through Jesus Christ. The message is still the same. Now, there's a lot more in my versions not um, legitimate, okay? It's just so you know that. But do you see what that scripture says? It's all biblical. It all comes from other scriptures. When you feed on the word of God so that you can read Psalm 23 and it come alive to you. And you can read it again and again and more things come alive to you. That you can pray that as a prayer and know that the Lord is my shepherd through any circumstance that I walk through. Yea, through I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. So I put a little picture on there of a little sheep and put in there, since the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I could ever need. Now grab your pens and also put or want. Don't forget that. I'm going to make you write that. Put or ever want. God supplies all. I went with apprehensions to the walk thinking, oh, okay, we're going to get through this. And it was the biggest blessing of my life. It was, now, not saying marriage or children, but <laughs> right recently it was a huge blessing that I was apprehensive about. What a wonderful, wonderful time because I said, I'll serve you. I don't know. I don't know if I'm walking through the valley of death. I don't know if I'm walking on the mountaintop. He said, oh, I know. You'll be walking on the mountaintop. And it was such a blessing to be a part of that and know that he took away every anxiety and fear and flipped them upside down. So the question on the picture was, why did Jesus come to earth? John 10 said that Jesus came to give you life. And not just so-so life, but abundant life as well as eternal life. So here's some of the different translations for that. The NIV says that I might have it more abundantly. The... the um, no, excuse me. The NIV says to the full. The King James Version says you might have it more abundantly. The NLT says a rich and satisfying life. The GMT, which I don't remember what that is now, in all its fullness. And the Good Word Translation, I really like this. 
A thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came so that my sheep will have life and so that they will have everything they need. I like that one. That's the good word translation. And it sure sounds like Jesus is saying the letters that David penned many, many years prior to that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Another reason for Jesus' coming we find in Matthew 10, verse 34 through 52. This is the troubling side. You mentioned it to me this morning, Mary Ann. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Because we have to decide who is the most important to us. Are we going to take the words of God and apply them to our life or are we going to worry about what others say and think? <clears throat> Verse 35, For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's not saying that there's going to be problems inside of our families. It's saying you have to decide who you're going to follow. Whether your husband follows or not, whether your wife follows or not, whether your children follow or not, are you going to be faithful to God? Are you going to follow? And then as you read and study this scripture again, uh, Hebrews, when it gives the hall of faith, says that Noah, out of holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And it was accredited to him as righteousness. That's one of the verses I hold on to because I know my God is much more faithful than I am and I see his promises that if I walk by faith, he will be faithful to bring my family to him. They still have a choice in everything. I have to accept that too. But the more that I am praying for them, the more I am walking by faith, the more I'm going to see him flip all of my apprehensions upside down. I've said it before and I'll say it again. When I said, okay, I'll give you everything. I'll become pastor, even though that seems crazy to me. I said, I'll give you my business. It doesn't make any sense to lose that. He said, I'll send your son back home to run it. He was gone. He wasn't here. So not only did I not lose my business to it, my son is there running it. Now, that's the kind of things that God will do, that crazy love he has for his children. We know it because we want to give good things to our children. How much more does he want to give us the Spirit? Don't take that verse out of context. The Spirit so we can walk through the valleys of the shadows of death. Verse 36 of Matthew 10 says, A man's enemies will be members of his own household, unfortunately. Verse 37, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And we're back to where we're supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow after him. He's expounding upon that and says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Verse 39, whoever finds their life, and it sounds a lot like John 10, 10, will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Sounds a lot like John chapter 12. <laughs> See the similarities? Verse 40 goes on, Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is my disciple, childlike faith, not children here, literally, but those who have childlike faith and come after me, Truly I tell you, very truly, whatever version yours has, that person will certainly not lose their reward. In Luke chapter 14, we read this. This is another teaching of Jesus. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, remember, brothers and sisters, Remember what I said, that doesn't mean he's teaching because so many people twist that scripture. It means that if you're to serve me and your spouse says, no, you're not, 
then I've got to serve God first. But I've also got to be an example to them, not have animosity and hatred, but show them loving kindness. I said in Sunday school class the other day, an example where a guy said, I'm going to divorce my wife. I'm going to make her so miserable. She's made me so mis miserable for so many years. I am going to go to her for the next 30 days, and I'm going to love her unconditionally. I'm going to just treat her like she was the princess of the world and everything else. And then after 30 days, man, I'm going to drop the hammer down, and she's going to be just devastated that she's going to lose this guy. Well, 30 days approached. And he was asked, well, are you going to do it? Are you going to divorce your wife? He said, no way. He said, she's the best woman that I could ever imagine because he denied himself, took up his cross, and followed after Christ. As Christ died for the church, he died for his wife, and their relationship was the best it ever could be. No way that he was going to worry about divorce anymore. He was going to live a marriage that was as the way God intended. And remember again, that was before sin ever came into the earth that God gave us marriage and the gift of children before mankind ever sinned. So if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It says it again. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you, first, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. Now let me tell you again, if you're a child of God, you've been completely, totally, your cup runneth over, to use David's terms, with the Spirit. So you have everything you need. Your bank account is full. But if you don't write checks on that bank account, how are you ever going to experience it? Okay? Verse 30, they'll ridicule you, saying that this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. You're able. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't you first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciples. Third time he said it. Salt is good. Oh, I think somebody said that earlier. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither for the soil, nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. And we're salt again, remember? Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now that's the end of Luke 14. What chapter comes next? Hard question. Luke 15, which is where I got to start talking Thursday night with a speech that I was not supposed to give. Another pastor was supposed to give it, but for some reason the schedule was mistaken. No, it wasn't mistaken. It wasn't a problem. It was God's intention again because that allowed me to start off with that story about the prodigal son and be able to finish up the story with grace, with sanctifying grace, that God will be the one that continues to walk. That was God's plan from the little bitty church pastor, not the big church pastor. Because, again, that was God's plan. Which I walked right wherever with the big church pastor in comparison. Not a mega church, 300 people or so. But, again, I used to go in and feel like, oh, this guy's much more equipped than me. No, the equipping is the same. God equips those. And he has equipped every single one of you in the ministry that he has called you to be. Whether it's your family, whether it's your workplace, whether it's a foreign mission field, I don't know that. But God knows that and you probably have some idea. It's a matter of whether you're going to follow what he says or not. But Luke 15 comes up next. And remember that Luke is giving an orderly account. And he writes about the cost of being a true disciple 
the first parable there, they're in sequence, so you've got to read both, so I went back and at least mentioned them. The first parable is about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep who leaves, loses one and leaves the 99 behind to go find that one because that's how important you are to the shepherd. Then the next parable is about a woman who has 10 coins and loses one and then finds it and there's so much rejoicing that you have that value. And then we read the parable of the prodigal father, not the prodigal son, because prodigal means extravagantly wasteful. The father is the one who seemed like he was the crazy one in the story because he would do all these things and still receive his child back and accept his child that was there living with him that, that still didn't want to behave like a citizen of his kingdom. The father is the one that that story's about. Ephesians chapter 1 to 2.10, two and I'm going to skip some verses, says this. I am writing to God's holy people, faithful followers of Jesus Christ. This is Paul's letter to that church to be shared with other churches. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Not some, not enough, but every in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. I'm skipping down to verse 9. God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his good pleasure. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And remember when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? Go therefore, spread the word, make disciples. <clears throat> Verse 11, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. That's furthermore. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Verse 14, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we could praise and glorify him. Verse 18, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Hmm. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. I'll throw in another translation, wrath just like everyone else. But, complete opposite, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much, I'm using NLT for those reasons that I'm emphasizing, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the, from de the dead, 
along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we were united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. That's why I like the NLT. You're not just a workmanship. You're a masterpiece. You're not just a piece of coal being turned into a diamond. You are a diamond to Him. And He will sanctify you through and through if you'll just walk in grace. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. What a wonderful, wonderful scripture from Paul to give us encouragement of who we are in Christ. Luke 15, 10 and 11 said this, In the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. Remember talking about that this week? Jesus continued is what the next verse says. There was a man who had two sons. The reason I'm pointing that out to you in that parable is Jesus continued. That's the name of our book that we're reading. Because we are to continue Jesus' work by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus continued here saying. So the reason he's saying there was a man with two sons is because he's already given the parable of the lost sheep. He's given the parable of the lost coin. And now he gives a parable of a man who had two sons, who neither one of them lived like his son. Don't forget that. But right before that verse says, in the same way, this is about the woman finding her coin and rejoicing. In the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When Jacob has been studying, he's been sending me little texts. said, do you read this this way? And he said, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. The angels are rejoicing because they're in God's presence because God is the one rejoicing. I'd never read that scripture that way, but I agree totally. My son revealed that to me. That's the nuggets that God gives you. The angels are rejoicing in the presence of God because he is going, all right! That lost one has been found. Don't forget that. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Live it. Don't let anything stand in your way. And it's not by your power or your might. It's by dying to the Spirit. Matthew 3.8 says in the NIV, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The NLT says, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Luke 3.8, that one was Matthew 3.8, you don't have them up there. This is Luke 3.8, says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. <laughs> and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Just because you go to church, just because you say you're a Christian, doesn't mean you are, sorry. For I tell you that out of these stones, <clears throat> God can raise up children for Abraham. That was the NIV. The NLT says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. So please, ladies from the walk, please, everyone that's here, keep walking in grace by faith. That's what saved you. That's what will help you walk through whatever it is, whether it's the valley of the shadow of death or the mountaintop. God will walk with you. He will carry you through it. You have already been supplied fully. Your cup runs over. You lack nothing. 
I want to close with this verse, Philippians 1, 6. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within me, says you, but I'm going to put me here. Let's even go there. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within Alan, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. That's our promise. We have nothing to fear, for the Lord is with us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you that, that your ways are perfect, that you would send your Son to die for us, that you have filled us completely with your Spirit, that we are a holy priesthood, that we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, fully equipped for the good works that you have planned for us so long ago, and that the angels are rejoicing because you are rejoicing when one that is lost is now found. We thank you and praise you that this is your mighty, perfect, glorious way and we just get to be a part of it. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.